Um, good. So supposedly, now there's also some way to make it use a fixed meeting ID instead of changing it all the time, and I haven't figured out how to make that stick. I keep turning it on, but it, somehow it turns itself off. Um, and ID. No, that just moves it around. All right, so we're down to this nonsense. I think I need to type the ID into my web page and update my web page before each class until I learn how to make it actually pay attention to the setting. Um, all right, this is 141. All right, and I put Zoom instructions, but I unfortunately believe that it would keep the ID fixed, and it doesn't seem to. Uh, Five four seven, two eleven, three forty nine, and there's the ID. Okay. All right. So it's six p.m. on some other day, twenty one. All right. Hopefully one of these days I'll figure out how to make it actually keep a fixed number for the ID. All right. Anyway, this class I think is not very full and there may be nobody attempting to join remotely anyway. But, sure, I got ad codes. I'll bring them up later. Uh, before I get the break. All right. So anyway, supposedly people can join this thing, although I guess I don't have anybody doing that. Right, that's right. I know that. That's that, that's fine. It should be sharing. Okay. So supposedly it's sharing and someone could in principle connect remotely, but I think nobody is doing it. Um, all right. There ought to be a picture of me on the camera somewhere, but I don't know where it is. Maybe this? Ought to be, well, who knows what's going on? I don't know what's going on. All right. Anyway, um, all right. So hopefully, if anybody wants to try it, you can tell me how to make that streaming work, but it doesn't really matter for today. Uh, I'll, if it's recording, I'll settle for that. I'd like all the classes to be streaming, and I assume within the first week, I will eventually learn how to make this stupid stuff work. You can't beat the price, but half the options don't work, as far as I can tell. Anyway, so. Uh, Let's see if there, oh, there was some fun news I wanted to show you, and I've got to wait till 10 after. Um, this is pretty interesting, although fantastically stupid. And this is very on target for this class. And uh, might as well mention this. What's that? Uh, oh, yeah, in principle. Okay. Anyway, um, so supposedly, I, I assume what's going on here is there's somebody that's just a moron administrator who has no idea what he's talking about. But this is in the U.S. military. They say if you send malware to the military, they're going to re-engineer it to turn it into a weapon and send it back to you. Which uh, this is Lieutenant General Vincent Stewart. So. I assume he's a random idiot. It's hard to understand what he's saying here. It makes no sense at all. But anyway, uh, that's the official word. Uh, this one is more like it. So MIT, somebody at MIT is launching a new cryptocurrency called Enigma, and they did not turn on two-factor authentication for their social media accounts. They reused old passwords, so someone took over their social media accounts and announced to everybody that there's a pre-purchase opportunity for the first 20 million and send your money to this account over here, and they got a bunch of money. And now they're saying, oh, gee, uh, maybe we should have thought about security. But of course, from their point of view, they probably wouldn't think about security until they actually announced the product. They didn't think about this particular social engineering trick, but that's a pretty good social engineering trick. There's another one that's been happening a lot in the last year. You just email a company, and you say, I'm the IRS, send me all your W-2s, or you just say, I'm another company you're doing business with, send a million dollars to this address, and a bunch of people will do it without like actually asking for permission. So, uh, the Elk Stack I just heard about because of the visiting speaker that came to the Hackers Club on Saturday, and he was a really impressive guy. He was the guy that 
worked for CrowdStrike and just identified the Russian hackers that attacked the Democratic National Committee. And I asked him what he thought of this. There's a guy in Fox News who will tell you that it wasn't the Russians that hacked the DNC because he watched the data transfer rate by looking at some packet captures and concluded that that couldn't possibly go over the network because it was 30 megabits per second and he thinks there's no network in America that goes that fast, which is a very strange argument. And I asked him what he thought of that guy and he said, that guy is why I drink. So anyway, um, but anyway, he also told me that everybody should learn how to make, to load up the elk stack so I'm going to add that to my CNET 50 class, which starts in eight days. Um, it is a network monitoring stack of sorts. I know Splunk, and he says the Elk stack is another one a lot of people use. And he says CCDC has an inject where they tell you to in install an Elk stack and get it working in like an hour or two while, while you're playing the contest. So uh, apparently it is something you're supposed to know and be good at. So I better throw it in my homework. So I'm going to see what I can do to figure it out and add that to the uh, CNET 50 class. Anyway. Oh, so I see we're 10 after, so let me get back to the uh, official stuff here. So I got a handout for this class, and maybe I can get lights on in the back. Let's see. I options. Oh, need an option. Sorry. So if you want to leave, have some of these. Pass around. I don't have a student agreement. I wouldn't have one for this class anyway, but I decided to quit wasting time on them. So I'll pass around an attendance sheet. So I can report who's here. The college wants me to keep track of who shows up. Um, it is 821. I'll put Mark on here. And and uh, there's room for anybody who wants to add, and I'm not going to throw anybody out for not showing up. There's no problem fitting people in here. Uh, let me just bring up the usual information about grades and such, which should be covered in the first class. So uh, you don't have to attend class. You can watch the live stream or the video or ignore it all completely and just read the book. All that matters is whether you learn it. Um, uh, hopefully attending class will have some value to you, but if you are busy or live far away or something, it is your choice. I'm trying to get the live streaming going. I'll try to keep this page updated with the right link to join the live stream so you can. Join it, and after the class is over, I'll post it on YouTube, so you can watch them asynchronously. Uh, there's a textbook in cryptography here. This textbook is a little bit more mathematical than other books I've used, but I'm not going to stress the math much in this course. You should learn a little math, um, but our main course here, my main goal here, like my other classes, is engineering, and I highly encourage you not to try to invent any cryptography. Don't even waste your time. There are the 10 smartest people on Earth write this crypto, and the wise thing is to be humble and just use it but use it correctly. Um, and uh, I, I'll, this is why I got motivated to teach this. I've been looking at how people actually use cryptography in real Android apps, and it is just appalling. It's like a small child using a hammer to drive a screw. It's just ridiculous. They have no idea what they're doing. Many, many Android apps use private key cryptography to encrypt your password, then they put the encrypted mess on your phone, then they try to hide the key on your phone somewhere. I mean, there has been something invented in 1974 called public key cryptography to solve this problem, but they don't seem to know that. And they seem to think it's okay to just use the first cryptographic thing that comes to mind, no matter how inappropriate it is for the job. And obviously it is true that no one has the security review process anywhere in the Android apps, which is what most companies tell me. They just get the cheapest vendor who outsources it to some dodgy country and they just use whatever comes back as long as it appears to work without making any attempt to find out what it's actually doing. So if you do learn how to actually use normal cryptography correctly, you would be a very valuable person. It is amazing, but I can prove it experimentally. Many people currently making corporate software do not have any idea what they're doing with cryptography. They do it all wrong, and this sails right through whatever testing processes occur, so apparently no one at the company has any clue how stupid they are, and out goes out the door. So we're just going to primarily focus on the standard stuff, AES, SHA, and RSA. Those are the standard ways to encrypt things. And if you do them correctly, they're all very good at securing your data. And if you don't know what you're doing, they do no good at all. So just applying them correctly is my goal for this class. So you should know a little algebra and the basic fundamentals of security. That's all you need. Uh, this book, um, here is the main textbook that will cover all the details of cryptography. However, as an application of cryptography, 
I've been doing cryptocurrencies. And that's what I'll talk about tonight. We have projects doing playing with cryptocurrencies. Um, they are one application of cryptography. And uh, all right, so here's the, the point here. You'll learn how to implement modern, modern cryptographic systems, choose appropriate methods, and how to perform some of the attacks. And here's a noise coming, probably telling me that someone is joining or something. Well, I have no idea how to find out. Anyway, um, we'll carry on. All right, so uh, there's probably some way to tell who's in there, but maybe I'll figure it out in the future. Anyway, so there's the book. Uh, like I say, you can join using Zoom. And so there's nothing due for a while. We had the first two classes, then a holiday, then this is the end of the ad period. And um, that's when things become due. The quizzes are online. So you take them before class. So before 9-11, take the quizzes on chapter one and two online um, with the usual City College online uh, system, which should be up here someplace. And perhaps I'm missing from my page. Uh, it's the uh, standard, uh, not Moodle, but whatever the new Canvas, the same old Canvas. I'll put it on here. I've got it on all my other pages, how to, how to log into Canvas. Um, you start from ccsf.edu and get your RAM ID and then log into Canvas. Um, so anyway, right by then, you'll take quizzes before the lecture on the teach class. And the homework also comes in online. Screenshots typically sent in by email. That's why I say you could take this class from, from Kansas or anywhere if you wanted to. Um, although they charge you out-of-state tuition. So if you actually want to get credit, it would be expensive. But anybody can just watch it and do the homework, and that's fine. All right. Uh, so I have a grading system such as it is. Let me find it down here someplace. There it is. Okay. This is pretty much the same thing I've been using for a long time. So you have some homework and some quizzes and a final exam, and that's added up to a bunch of points, 90% is an A and 80% is a B and so on. And there will be a bunch of extra credit projects. So if you do them and you do everything else pretty well, you typically don't have to take the final, which is fine with me, but you can if you like. And... Uh, that's it. There's quizzes. Uh, if you miss a quiz past the deadline, send me an email. I'll work something out. Uh, last semester is the first semester I did it this way, and I just let people take it with no penalty. If I have to, I'll take some points off, but maybe I won't have to. The only point is to keep people up with it. I find out the lecture is much more effective if people read the chapter first. So the quizzes are there to force you to read the chapter first. They're open book. You have two tries. The higher one wins. So you know, it shouldn't be too hard. And last semester, most everybody was getting 18s and 20s on the quizzes, as they should. It's really just a way to encourage you to study. Uh, a lot of hands-on projects. Um, you got to turn them in on time or you lose five points. If you turn them in more than two weeks late, they're worth nothing, unless you have a good reason, like you're in the hospital or something. Um, so uh, if people are actually using these attacks to do illegal things, that's a bad. And I'll kick you out of the class, but that'll be the least of your worries. Um, and of course, if you use the hacking lab down there, 214, all the other people are using that lab for hacking projects, so the passwords are often being stolen by key loggers and all sorts of evil things are happening in there. So be aware, don't do banking or personal email or anything on there. And uh, oh, I got rid of the student agreement, so this is not true. All right, and you don't get points just for showing up or lose them for not showing up. All that matters is homework and quizzes, but there is a in-class question and answer thing. Well, I used to use iClickers, now I'm using Kahoot, which is just a more fun way to do it. And uh, that's worth extra credit if you get in the top few of the in-class questions and answers. All right, any questions about anything? How many people need added codes? A few, okay, I'll bring them up later. I think I'll have a break pretty soon and I'll bring them up then. Um, all right. Yeah, I got a question on what yeah. you said, uh, you said uh, you do homework online, then, then you said watch out for something where you get charged for out-of-state tuition? Uh, yeah, well, if you actually wanted to take a course from another state, and then you could just watch the video, and that, that'd be free. But if you actually want to get credit, you'd have to be officially enrolled, and that would charge you uh, mm -hmm. out-of-state tuition. So shouldn't affect anybody here. For all of you, it's free, I guess, at least if you're a San Francisco resident. When we get charged for tuition, we don't... You drop out of the class physically, but don't drop out uh, after September the first, which is coming up for Is that right? I think so. Well, how would they know if you drop? Oh, I guess they know if you drop out physically because I have to turn in a report. Oh, I didn't know that. There is a way to do that. But if you turn in any homework or sign one of these sheets, I know you're here, and I won't yeah. mark you as a no-show. Um, so, and if people are attending by. Uh, Online Zoom, they should just send an email to the same place your homework goes, which I think is seen at dot one forty one at Gmail. Let me just check that. It'll be at the bottom of all these homeworks. 
Yeah. So if you, uh, for some reason, are not able to attend physically, but you want to make sure you don't appear as a no-show, send an email there telling me you are here. Um, that'll be applied to the people of which there's at least one who have joined in the stream. All right. Good. So here's the stuff I thought I'd show you today. Um, just motivational stuff. None of this is directly related to the textbook yet, but this is uh, something that got my attention. You know, I ignored Bitcoin for a while because it's obviously a very, very risky investment. A lot of, there are a lot of things that go up and down wildly. So people say you could have got rich and that you could get rich, but you could also go broke. Um, and Bitcoin is actually very interesting. Um, Bitcoin has become more interesting and other cryptocurrencies have become more interesting. And what's happened here is when you have a new technology of any kind, the early adopters are the people who can't use the old one for some reason. Usually because what they're doing is illegal or forbidden or impossible somehow in the old technology. So when you have a new thing like the internet, the pornographers jump there and other people who are somewhat disapproved of are shady. So the people that jumped on cryptocurrency are almost all criminals. Not that I'm trying to say you're criminal for using it, but the people who had a reason to use it are the criminals that couldn't use ordinary things like Visa and MasterCard and cash. Um, so the first decades of development of Bitcoin is just a deplorable litany of crime and loss and fraud because the first adopters were criminals. But what's happening is it's slowly developing an actual legitimate place in, in the world. And the other cryptocurrencies have even more argument to be legitimate. So if it is in fact accepted by governments and rendered legal and legitimate, then it will adopt its real value. In the meantime, its value floats uh, in response to a lot of disturbing factors. Primarily, every statement made by the government of China shows Bitcoin way up and down right now. So that's, it's like any other highly risky investment that goes up and down a lot. So I certainly don't recommend it as an investment, but it is important for us to understand the mathematical properties of it, I think, because Things based on Bitcoin are really coming. Banks are really going to use them. Insurance companies are really going to use them. And many other people are going to use blockchain technology in the future. And there's a huge demand for people who understand the cryptography of blockchains because there are a dozen different kinds being developed. Bitcoin itself is not particularly interesting to any legitimate business, but the protocol underneath it is extremely important. And Bitcoin represents the sort of beta test of blockchains showing that they really do scale to the whole world and that they're quite secure for the whole world. So that's the game. And I want to start with this video, understand the blockchain in two minutes, which is why I brought these speakers. Um, and let me see if I can find it. Yeah, there it is. All right. Let's see if my when you vote, have you ever wondered okay. whether your ballot is actually counted? Okay. If you meet someone online, how do you know that who they say they are? When you buy coffee that's labeled fair trade, what makes you so certain of its origin? To be sure, really sure, about any of those questions, you need a system where records can be stored, facts can be verified by anyone, and security is guaranteed. That way, no one could cheat the system by editing records, because everyone using the system would be watching. Systems like this are on the horizon, and the software that powers them is called a blockchain. Blockchains store information across a network of personal computers, making them not just decentralized, but distributed. This means no central company or person owns the system, yet everyone can use it and help run it. This is important because it means it's difficult for any one person to take down the network or corrupt it. The people who run the system use their computers to hold bundles of records committed by others, known as blocks in a chronological chain. The blockchain uses a form of math called cryptography to ensure that records can't be counterfeited or changed by anyone else. You've probably heard of the blockchain's first paragraph, a form of digital cash called Bitcoin, that you can send to anyone, even a complete stranger. Bitcoin is different from credit cards, PayPal, or other ways to send money because there isn't a bank or financial middleman involved. Instead, people from all over the world help move the digital money by validating other Bitcoin transactions with their personal computers, earning a small fee in the process. Bitcoin uses the blockchain by tracking records of ownership over this digital cash, so only one person can be the owner at a time, and the cash can't be spent twice, like counterfeit money in the physical world can. But Bitcoin is just the beginning for blockchain. In the future, blockchains that manage and verify online data could enable us to launch companies that are entirely run by algorithms, making self-driving cars safer, 
help us protect our online identities, and even track the billions of devices on the Internet of Things. These innovations will change our lives forever, and it's all just beginning. To learn more about the urgent future of the blockchain, please visit so I showed that video some, some classes last semester. I think that video is very useful because it shows you the good and the bad. The good is Bitcoin can keep track of who owns money very well. The bad is that the people that push it are almost all crooks, and the primary technique of stealing your money is pump and dump. They, go, they talk about how wonderful the new Bitcoin thing is. They offer money. They offer a chance to invest. Everyone invests, and then they just steal the money and leave. Or their product was completely fake. The software doesn't exist, there's nothing there, or it's poorly written and it all gets hacked. This happened over and over and over, and that's why they get the habit of vastly overselling it. Exactly how is a Bitcoin going to drive my car? Um, how is it going to help maintain anonymity and also make it so I know who I'm talking to in a chat room? They have no idea what they're talking about. None of that is true. They're just in the habit of wildly overselling it. Bitcoin is the answer to every problem, give me your money now. So anyway, it has a purpose, but the people promoting it are trying to steal your money primarily and all the other ones. So you have to be aware of that. It is far more full of wild exaggerations than other products right now, but it's becoming more mature. So let's take a look at those blockchains. There's a nice demo of it at the link blockchain 10 here. And this, I think, is a very good way to understand it. So... This guy made a nice list. So here's a block. So you have, this is a live demo you can do. So it's got a block. There's a nonce, which is a number you can add to the block. And down here, you put some data. So I can put in data like Sam um, gets five coins. And then Sam pays Sue one coin. Okay, so you put down here information about who has money and where the money went. And then it's red right now because this block has not been mined. If you take all the data and you calculate the hash, here's the hash, it's just this long random number starting with D. And in order to make it difficult to mine, you choose an arbitrary rule, which is you must make the hash start with a certain number of zeros. This is an artificial thing just to make it difficult to mine. So now if I mine, my computer when JavaScript will mine, okay, it found, it changed the nonce until it mined it, and now the hash starts with four zeros. So that's the current level of difficulty. So the reason it's turned green is this bit has now been mined. Then which this block has been mined and signed with that. Now the miner will now announce over the network, I have mined this block. And whoever mines it first wins and becomes accepted. And they get a cash reward, a certain amount of Bitcoins for doing that mining. So let's take a look at the blockchain. So here's the first one. And so if I put in Sam has one coin here, and I mine that one. Okay, this one turns green. Now if I put uh, Sam pays Sue 0 0.5 coins here, and mine that one. Yes takes a random amount of time to mine it. Okay, now that that's done. So now we're ready for more things to happen over here like Sue pays Bill 0 0.1 coins. Okay, now let's see if I can get this junk out of the way. Okay, so um, this is not mined yet. Now if I try to change my mind and try to forge this and say I have two coins, all of these don't match anymore. That's the point of this. It'll only match if this is left alone. Now they match. And the point is you can, very, you can verify that all this stuff hashes to this one hashes to that value. And there's part of this value is included in the next one. And the hash of this one is included in the next one. So if this one verifies, you know that the whole chain is valid right to that point. That's the point of the thing. That's why they say it's secure in that after you have a few blocks mined, it becomes impossible to cheat the system. Now, there are some assumptions, like there always are. Here's the most important assumption. In, suppose people are mining, and they have a certain cryptographic power. It's a race. Whoever mines the block first gets the prize. So the idea is the fastest computers in the world will mine and turn in mined blocks to get the reward. Now, if I wanted to steal money, I would have to spend money, get 
enough blocks mined after it to convince the vendor to believe it was immutable, take the product, and then go back and alter it, and then somehow calculate all the intervening blocks so fast that my new chain could subvert the old one. I would need a computer much faster than the ones that are doing the real mining. And the point of the system is to be designed so that if you had a computer that fast, you would make more money by just doing normal mining than by trying to cheat the system. So there is an assumption here. For example, a lot of people believe, with fairly good reason, that the NSA has awesome technology, 20 years ahead of the rest of us. So you might reasonably wonder that even if the public, all the privately owned machines in the world are mining, if the NSA couldn't forge the blockchain and trick you because their stuff really is a thousand times faster. And that is, I suppose, in principle possible. Uh, anyway, that's the way the thing works. And the idea is, as long as nothing crazy is happening, like somebody joining the game who's malicious and has a computer far faster than the fastest computers we know of, this system is very easy to keep stable. And if you wait till a few blocks have gone past, anything that happened back here can't be erased or changed anymore. So you can safely use this to sell people things, confident that this guy is not going to be able to lie about how much money they transferred to someone else later. That's the game. And that's what Bitcoin has proven it really worked. So like I say, Bitcoin itself is extremely hazardous to be involved in. There's a lot of scams, pyramid schemes. It's primarily used for money laundering. The main reason anybody uses it is to do something that is illegal with their current currency so they can hide what they're doing. There are, of course, some people who have uh, political convictions and they want to be free of the government and they maintain personal privacy as sort of a statement of a political belief, but they are very small in number compared to the people who have to use Bitcoin because what they're doing would be shut down if they used any other kind of currency. Um, the same with any kind of privacy thing, like Tor. It's there for people who have some personal conviction to privacy, but the people who really need it are the criminals who use it primarily because they have a really good need for privacy, far more than most people that just have a conviction. Yeah? But aren't there a number of online Yes, Bitcoin is becoming, um, it's not used by any significant amount because the average consumer sees no benefit. So, I mean, they do it primarily as a stunt. I don't think very many of them get enough Bitcoin transactions to really justify it, but it's a way to be trendy. Right now, it's sort of a fashion statement. Yeah, like people going through things. So, right now, it's, it's a fashion statement for political activists and a tool for criminals. But if some government actually accepted it and approved it, then it could become a legitimate financial vehicle. And that may or may not happen with Bitcoin, but that is certainly happening for other blockchain-based systems. Real banks are bringing them out for other purposes. Um, so like I say, when I first learned about this, this Bitcoin, to teach kids, give them a piggy bank, six months later, smash the bank and steal the money. Then they understand Bitcoin. That is most people's experience with Bitcoin. You give your money to somebody, you don't understand what you're doing, and pretty soon they steal the money and leave. That's a lot of people had that experience. Um, and, crypto, and then after I got more involved in cryptocurrencies, I heard about Lisk. Lisk went out about, came out about a year ago in San Francisco. It was trumpeted as the greatest new coin ever. I found out about it about two days before it went out, so I tried to install the software. The help pages didn't even exist. They had page one, when you click the page two link, it's not there. The software wasn't even there. When you try to download it, the download links don't work. When you run it, it won't run. I said, this is launching tomorrow. And it did, and it had a very entertaining headline automatically generated. It said, Lisk falls 100.00% in first day of trading. Because within three hours of launching, it got hacked so badly that you could reach right in someone else's account and steal the money. And that's what happened. It was just complete garbage, poorly written, and crashed. It's still out there, but I don't think it made it to number three. There are still some believers saying Lisk is great. But the people that invested lost 100.00% of their money, and this is not something I recommend. Anyway, um... So Mt. Gox was the first really big one to go down. This guy was a Magic the Gathering fan, and he had a domain name that stood for Magic Gathering Online Exchange, and then he discovered Bitcoin and repurposed it to be a Bitcoin trader. And uh, this, this is a place where you could send uh, real money, like dollars, and turn it into Bitcoins, and this would then reside on his servers where he either stole them or didn't secure them and let them get stolen by someone else. And uh, they went, went to prison in Japan and lawsuits came, but that was 7% of all the Bitcoins in the world stolen in that one bank. Then uh, here's the in $460 million disaster. Here's the guy that set it up. Um, here's another 1% of them stolen. Another one exchanged hacked in Hong Kong and Bitfinex. And another one lost 65 million, 5 million here. 180,000 ethers and 250 bitcoins stolen there. 
Uh, another pyramid scheme shut down, another bit floor shuttered after virtual heist. Many, many people put up a website, people send them money, and uh, one of them actually left a message in the bulletin board. Well, guys, I decided that I'm not getting paid enough, so I took the money and left. Have a good day. The people haven't thought this through. Now, you could buy Bitcoins or mine them and store them on your own computer and not put them under someone else's control or put them offline on a USB stick and then nobody could steal them. But most people buying it don't understand that they're trusting the exchange. They send them money, they say you have Bitcoin, and they don't think about gee, what if the exchange just steals it? Because they're used to the American banking system where there's like insurance and an FDIC and the government and there's uh, reserve requirements and you can sue and get it back and credit cards will give you a refund and you don't get any of that stuff with Bitcoin. You send a thousand bucks to some guy on a website, you don't even know what country they're in, you don't even know their real name. When they steal it, you're hosed. No government even knows what jurisdiction it's in. You know, these people say, get the government out of my money. I used to be a financial professional. I like the government and my money. Government is there because people steal money and then you wish you had courts and oversight bodies and regulations and all that stuff. Anyway, um, yeah. Is Bitcoin, is it like listed as a stock? No, uh, its legal status is still unclear. Um, the government said about a year ago, the American government decided how you pay taxes on it, which I forget and it's not as a stock. Um, but the part where you change real dollars into Bitcoin is the part where the government has a say in it, and what's happened is most of the exchanges that permit that have been banished. The one that survives, which has the best reputation, is Coinbase in San Francisco. Coinbase wanted to be the legal Bitcoin exchange, and they wanted to obey all American regulations and financial regulations and try to make it, they're trying to help legitimize Bitcoin. Most of the serious Bitcoin enthusiasts would like to get away from the criminal past and make it standard legitimate, and use it for various purposes. But in order to do that, there has to be a legal way to transfer dollars into Bitcoin and Bitcoin into dollars. And Coinbase will do that. But in order to stay legal, they keep having, they have a team of lawyers and they're always talking to government financial people to try to find out what to do. And about six months ago, the government came to Coinbase and they said, we have decided that anyone using Bitcoin at all amounts to probable cause that they're engaged in money laundering and tax evasion. And we demand complete records of everyone in your whole database. And they gave that over to the government, which it seems to me is going to alienate 99% of their customers. But they're serious that they aren't planning to shut and steal the money and hide in another country. They want to really be a permanent American presence that lets you use cryptocurrencies legally. So they're trying to cooperate with the government and we'll see what comes of it all. Yeah. Well, uh, it turned out there was a lot of demand for it. Almost all of it, various ways of money laundering, really. Um, but there were a lot of people that wanted to use it enough to buy it. It just was put on the open market and people bid it up to that. So at first it was just a stunt and nobody cared for a few years. Then some people started noticing you could turn your money into Bitcoin. Now you can move it to another country and nobody knows. You can hide your identity. So you can pay things like ransom for cryptocurrency. You can take your local worthless currency like your Argentinian money that's falling and turn it into something like gold that won't fall so much. And uh, various people found that even as crazy as Bitcoin is, it's better than their alternative. And they move their money into it. It's it basically to escape government regulation, which is what people call either crime or money laundering. Why does that make it so? Why does that increase its worth? Well, uh, it's a very good question, and I'm not a stock analyst to give an authoritative statement, but here's my impression. The reason it's going up now is because people see legitimacy on the horizon. They see in maybe three or four years, it will be 100% legal, legitimate, and suddenly it'll grow way up. And so they, like a startup, they think it has proven its merit and it's going to go up more. So they throw money at it like the bubble. You know, they think it's going to go up more, so they invest more. It essentially is like a high value commodity. It's like buying a postage stamp that's currently fashionable and being collected, but it might go out of fashion at any moment. And that's the issue of any kind of high value commodity. So here's another one that got hacked and a Chinese one got hacked. Here's the big heist before 2014. Many, many people had the experience of buying Bitcoins and having them stolen from them. Uh, and on it goes. And then when the Secret Service agent started breaking modern uh, illegal businesses like uh, Silk Road, the Secret Service and FBI agents started stealing the Bitcoins. 
because it was not well understood by their superiors. So there's a way they could take it. Um, so, you know, it's a lot of money just sitting there in some form that your bosses don't understand. You could put it in your pocket and they might not notice. And they eventually noticed, but there's that price history we were talking about. Bitcoin launched back here in like 97 and just sat there at nothing is just a stunt for computer programmers. And then people started using it and then it had one peak back here and then it went up again recently. Um, so we'll, I'll talk a bit more about why, but I, the most important thing I want to mention here is the China, the whole point of Bitcoin, it was a political protest against the 2008 financial crisis caused by the banks lying about the value of securities. So the, found, the person who created Bitcoin, who has never been identified under the fake name Satoshi Nakamoto, probably a British cryptographer, but nobody knows at all, which is not a very good reassuring thing. The person that created it won't even admit, won't even acknowledge himself. And he has $100 million worth of Bitcoins he has never cashed out, just sitting on them, which sort of suggests that the person who knows most about it has no confidence in it. But anyway, um, he announced it and he made it, I'm going to not let anybody devalue the currency. He was horrified as I was at the time by Obama's tarp, where you just print a trillion dollars and throw it on the ground and let the bank steal it in order to save the economy. It turned out, apparently Obama was right and that worked. But according to all economic theories, that should have destroyed everything. Money is supposed to be worth something because you don't do crazy things like that. And, uh, so he, like me, said, this is terrible. How can they do this? And he said, I want some kind of currency where no government can ever do something appalling like that again. I want something that's not controlled by any one government or any one bank or anything. And he made Bitcoin. And the result, the idea was everybody in the world will be mining. Nobody will be able to control it. But the problem is Bitcoin uh, rewards the miners with the fastest CPU. That is all you need because then you'll win the race and you'll get the reward. If your CPU is not the fastest, you will never win the race and you'll get nothing. And it turns out that the real limitation is the price of electric power. And China has a system where I think all you have to do is bribe some government official. You can get free power next to the hydroelectric plants or something. The end result is the fast computers are all in China. So almost all the Bitcoins are mined by 10 people in China and they control Bitcoin. And therefore, the Chinese government controls Bitcoin. So every time a Chinese government official says something good about Bitcoin, the price goes up. And every time a Chinese government official says something bad about Bitcoin, the price goes down. So it ends up not being this globally distributed thing that it was intended to be. Um, but it does persist. Yeah. Do the Chinese, have they set up um, something similar to, you know, gold mining uh, for uh, no. Well, see that. Yeah, I know what you're saying. That's a very good question about gold mining. Um, third world gold mining is in World of Warcraft, where you make characters and they go do quests and get things like magic items and they sell them for money. Bitcoin has a technology that prevents that. You can't have some low power machine stealing some money. Nobody gets anything except the fastest computer in the world. So you can't do that. You can't get a thousand weak machines and really get anywhere. People try that with pools where they get a lot of small computers to try to add up. And the current situation is that none of them have much chance of competing against the server clusters in China. So you might think that if a uh, hundred million machines work together, they could compete with China, but in practice, that's not happening. It might happen eventually. Yeah. When you're mining, are you saying that everybody's mining the same one at the same time? Yes. Everybody's mining the same block. They're trying to change that nonce to get enough zeros in the hash. So they're just picking random numbers for the nonce and calculating the hash over and over and over until somebody finds a hash with enough zeros in front of it, and then they win the race. And so it's just how many hashes per second you can calculate. That's all it is. So is, and by doing that, is that the actual Bitcoin, or are they saying just by doing that now we're going to grant you this Bitcoin? Uh, if you are the first one to mine the block, you then send a signal out to the other miners over the network, and after it reaches everyone, and they all agree who won the race, then you get a reward because the block you mine includes your reward. You take those transactions, you add a transaction at the end that says, I get the reward, and then you mine it. And if that block is accepted, you've got the reward. It's in the blockchain. And is it a set reward? Yes, it's a set reward. It started at, I think, 50 Bitcoins per block for the first four years, and then it halved to 25, and now it's halved to 12 and a half Bitcoins per block. The idea is it will, the incentive to make people build mining rigs for a while, but in the long run, it'll become insignificant, and then they will make their money from transaction fees. You can 
transfer Bitcoins and not include a tip, just like you can ride an Uber and not include a tip, but the miners don't have to mine all the transactions. They choose which ones to include in their block. Then they add something at the bottom says, I get some, then they mine it. And if they win the race, they win. So now that Bitcoin is full, there's been huge pressure to pay more and more. And it's gotten to where you have to put a tip of like three to five dollars in your transaction or no one will mine it. And that was the plan. The plan was Bitcoin would be self-sustaining after a while, where a little bit of each transaction would be taken out for the fee. And that was what would motivate people to bother mining it. And it's in a the original planner made it quite well. It's, it's uh, gradually transitioning from putting out new Bitcoins every time a block is mined to just letting people get the tips when they mine it. These are very good questions. Well, it's been about 45 minutes. I think I need to stop this Zoom session and start over. Um, I think let's take a 10 minute break. We'll pick up at five minutes to seven and I'll get the ad codes for anybody who needs them. Uh, so we'll pick up at five after seven. Let me figure out how to stop this. Stop share. Um, stop. Uh, there's a chat which says polls. Should TA keep an eye on chat? That would be a good idea, yeah. Um, and I don't know how to end the session. Oh, yeah, this, put your name on there if you, uh, just so I know you're here. And let me see if I can figure out how to end the session. Maybe I have to close this. Yeah, end meeting for all.